Hi, hello. I haven't seen you guys in a while. How is everyone doing? Hi, Renee. I'm doing okay. How are you? I'm doing good. Well, hey guys. I'm doing well too. Thank you. And I hope you guys are okay over there. I'm really glad to hear everyone's doing well. So I want to ask you guys, how are you prepping for UPS? I, for one, have do not feel prepared at all. And I've been struggling trying to manage within my time studying and also assignments. I feel super underprepared too. I can't believe we're so close to our mid-semester exams already. Well, same here. I feel like it's just a blink and we here we are with our middle test again. I'm so glad I'm not the only one who feels this way. So, okay, what will our topic of discussion be today? So today, we'll be talking about pregnancy diagnosis and fetal position in both small and large animals. And we'll be also discussing the possible differential diagnosis for pregnancy. Hmm, sounds interesting. Okay, but maybe before we jump into our topic, we should probably introduce ourselves. So, hi! We're from Group 2. My name is Renee, NIMB0419836 with my group members. I'm Deandra, NIMB0419844. And well, hello everyone, and my name is Azaria Rizky Danida, NIMB0418045. Right, so now that we've introduced ourselves, let's get this podcast started. Maybe we can start with the basics, like how to diagnose pregnancy. So what exactly are the different methods of diagnosing pregnancy in animals? I feel like we talked about them during our lecture, but I don't really remember anything. Oh yeah, I think we did. From what I remember, there are five different types of pregnancy diagnosis, which are biological, chemical, hormonal, ultrasonography, and rectal palpation. Oh yeah, I remember. Chemical diagnosis is the one that has to do with pregnancy-specific proteins, right? That's right. But what's pregnancy-specific protein, though? Oh, it's a pregnancy-associated glycoprotein that was identified in cattle as an important compound released by the fetus to aid in maintaining the corpus luteum. Ah, I see. You have to do that within a certain time frame, was it? Yeah, it's usually done at the beginning of the pregnancy. Ah, then what about the biological diagnosis? Uh, That's where you test for either PMSG or estrogen in the urine. Yeah, the PMSG test is called the Asian Zondic and Gallimanini test. And it's usually done between the 50th to 80th day of pregnancy in mares. While the estrogen test is called the Fluorescency Cuboni test and it's done after, I think, 120 days. And I think you can also test through progesterone hormone assays, right? I remember that this test has a 93.1% accuracy. That's right. It helps detect elevated levels of progesterone in animals. Um, I think another very common method is ultrasonography, which has an even higher accuracy percentage at about 95%. So earlier pregnancy can actually be detected by looking for the embryonic sac vesicle on the ultrasound monitor. Yeah, and also most producers actually consider rectal palpation to be one of the fastest and most accurate methods to pregnancy diagnosis in cattle because, well, it's simple and it's economical. It can detect whether or not there's a fetus inside the cow and also how far along the pregnancy is. And why is it more economical? So cattle farms actually prefer this method because it's significantly cheaper than, let's say, an ultrasound scan. All you need for this is a skilled handler or a vet because they must insert their entire arm into the cow's rectum in order to palpate the fetus and determine how far along the pregnancy is. So for instance, at the 30-day mark, the uterus will be filled with fluid and feel slightly thinner. One of the horns will also be enlarged slightly more than the other and the palpator will be able to feel this enlargement of this horn. Yeah, and at 45 days, the palpator should be able to feel the fetus at this point. So it should be about one to one and a half inches. And at the 60th day mark, if I'm not mistaken, the uterus is enlarged 
and measures about 8 to 10 inches, while the fetus is already at 2 inches. Yep, and at the 90-day mark, the fetus is approximately 6 inches long and should be located on the floor of the body cavity. So by this point, the palpator can also palpate the uterine artery to see if there is a whirring pulsation. Wait, hold on. What's so significant about the whirring pulsation again? Um, I think it's the artery that carries blood through the developing fetus. And it is also a positive sign for pregnancy. Oh, okay. I also want to wanted to add that by day 120 of the pregnancy, the cornua should be even bigger. And by day 150, a strong throbbing known as fremitus can, be, can sometimes be palpated. Yep, and following that, the fetus just keeps growing and growing up until day 270. And that's around the time when the labor should occur, right? Yes, uh, that's why rectal palpation is so effective for assessing pregnancy because it has a 95% accuracy after the 60th day. Wait, wait, what about risks? Do you guys know if there are any disadvantages associated with rectal palpation? Well, actually, yeah, there is. Since this method is quite invasive, it involves the risk of causing fetal damage and as a result, losing of pregnancy and consequent deterioration of the cow's well-being. Oh, then we have to be really careful about that then. Oh yeah, um, we also talked about differential diagnosis in pregnancy during our class, right? Do you guys know anything about that? Well, you know, I never fully understood what differential diagnosis meant um, during the lectures, but I know one of them is pyometra, and that's about it. Oh, okay. So, pyometra is one of the more severe stages of uterine diseases. And I think we learned about how these uterine diseases are highly influenced by progesterone. And if I remember correctly, progesterone is still present and continues in the body for up to two months. So essentially, it prepares the body for pregnancy, and this cycle can continue multiple times. So if the animal isn't pregnant during, sorry, after these cycles, what happens is that the uterine lining thickens and thickens over time, causing fluid to seep into the uterus. Wait, hold on. Pyometra is really common in dogs, right? It is. It's very common in dogs and cats, but sometimes can also happen in cattle. Ah, so the fluid seeping into the uterus causes pyometra, is it? Yes, well, technically hydrometra happens first. This is when the uterus is filled with lymphatic fluid. And as time progresses, the uterus will not only accumulate lymphatic fluid, but it also accumulate um, mucus. So this stage is called mucometra. And if mucometra is left untreated, it will lead to a bacterial infection and at the end and the end result will cause pyometra, where the uterus is full of pus. Oh, right. This is the most severe stage, right? I think I've read that if the animal is left untreated, it can even cause endotoxemia and sepsis. Yeah, it's really dangerous for the animal. Not only that, but in some cases, the whole uterus has to be removed, so the animal can't ever reproduce. Ah, I've seen this happen when I was interning, and it's not really a pretty sight. And you can see the uterus from the abdomen, and it looks enlarged and lumpy, I guess. Yeah, I've seen it also at the vet, and it looks really uncomfortable for the animal. Um, Actually, I think there are a few more, right? Uterine tumor and fetal death, but I don't know much about them. Oh, from what I recall, uterine tumors can be either benign or cancerous. So dogs are usually affected by leomyomas, which are benign and non-cancerous, though rare cases are more often seen in both middle-aged dogs or older dogs. Now, these leomyomas myomas arise from the uterine smooth muscle and epithelial tissues, which are the tissues that line the internal organs and cavities. Ah, cats and cattle can get tumors too? and they have a higher possibility of developing adenocarcinomas and the cancerous types of tumor. That's what I read. Ah, okay, hold on. What's the other one again? Was it mummification or maceration or something? Or are they the same thing? 
Um, well, they're different, similar but different. So mummification happens in a lot of animals, but is commonly found in cattle, and I believe more frequently seen in Guernsey and Jersey cattle. And what happens is that the fetal membranes become shriveled and dried, and the allantoic fluid, fluid amnion, and the fetus is reabsorbed by the body. And the uterus contracts on the fetus, molding it into a dry and contorted mass, which eventually leads to death, and of the uh, death of the fetuses. And fetus in the middle of um, last trimest- trimester of gestation, I guess. Oh, okay. Wait. So then, what's maceration? Is that also a form of fetus death? Yeah, except in maceration, the fetus undergoes gradual bacterial digestion in the uterine fluid and can happen at any point of the pregnancy. Oh, right. Mummification is the one where the fetus is still intact, right? That's right. So maceration usually leaves the fetus partially destroyed and leaves only parts of the bones and tissue. Now, extracting this is actually quite a difficult process too. Yeah, and the main difference between the two is what causes it. The mummification happens because of the torsion or compression of the umbilical cord or the uterus, while maceration happens either because of uterine inertia, bacteria, and protozoan infection. Oh, okay, I understand now. Um, I know that maceration in animals can occur, but only less than 5%, if I'm not mistaken. What about mummification? Um, by theory, mummification, especially in cattle, happen less than 2% of the time. But I think I've read that the chance of mummification can increase in cows who have experienced this condition in the past. Oh, I see. That's really interesting. Okay, so let's talk about fetal position now. There are a few different types, right? If I'm not mistaken. The only one I remember is presentation, though. Is that the same as situs? Yeah, so basically it's the relation of the spinal axis of the fetus to that of the down. The presentation can be either longitudinal, transverse, vertical, or diagonal. The fetus's orientation is either cranial or caudal in the longitudinal presentation and dorsal or ventral in the transverse presentation. If I recall correctly, I think cranial longitudinal is considered to be the normal presentation. Oh, I always thought that presentation and situs were two different things. The one I remember the most is position. And which one is that again? It's different from posture, right? Yeah, those two are different. Um, Position is the relation of the dorsum of the fetus to the quadrants of the paternal pelvis. So these quadrants can include the sacrum, the right ilium, the pubis, and the left ilium. So, dorsal sacral is considered the normal position. Wait, so what's posture? Oh, uh, posture is the relation of the fetal extremities. So, this will include the head, the neck, and the limbs to its own body. So, these extremities can either be flexed, they can be extended, or retained. And if they are retained, it can either be to the right, to the left, above, or even below the fetus. So, how does the fetal position differ from the from different species? Um, I'm not quite sure about other animals, but the normal position of the calf in cattle is backside up. So, in normal cattle delivery, the fetus is in cranial longitud- longitudinal presentation and in dorsosacral position, with the head, neck, and forelimbs extended. Caudal presentations, from what I've heard, are considered abnormal in cattle, but Unassisted delivery can occur with the fetus presented caudally if the hind limbs are extended. Oh, okay. Um, If I remember correctly, for horses, during the third trimester, the equine fetus is normally in a dorsal pubic position. So the fetus rotates to the dorsal sacral position during the final couple days of gestation, in which it is assisted by the rolling of the mare. Ah, that's really interesting because I think in dogs, the normal position of a puppy before deliver, delivery is with the fetal backbone lying along along the top of the womb. 
That is pretty interesting because who would have thought that there would be such a big difference between animal species? Right? It's so fascinating how many different fetal positions there are. And yeah, wow.、Um, we've discussed so much today and it was a lot of info to process, guys. Yeah, we've talked quite a bit on our topic today and I'm really hoping that it'll stick so that we can remember it for our midterms. Yeah, I also hope our conversation today can help others understand the topic a little better as well. Right? I would love to continue this discussion, but I'm afraid we're out of time. Ah, yeah. Time flies、uh, when you're busy talking, is it? Yeah. See you all soon. Remember to stay healthy and drink lots of water. Yay. So that marks the end of our podcast for this Ute S session. We'll see you soon. Bye.